The Lexus UX is the most credible small SUV the brand has ever offered, pioneering self-charging hybrid power in this lifestyle-orientated sector. The establishment needs to take notice. One of the market's most profitable segments at present is that for premium branded mid-sized SUVs of the more compact sort. Lexus is a late comer to this sector, but in characteristic style has brought something different to it in the form of this UX model. The UX competes directly against premium small crossover models like the Volvo XC40, the Jaguar E-Pace, uh, the Audi Q3, the BMW X1 and the Mercedes GLA. The angular Lexus NX, which previously represented the company against rivals like those, has been repositioned a little further up market as an alternative to slightly larger medium-sized SUVs, so think Audi Q5s and BMW X3s. So, does the UX stand a chance against such an army of fiercely talented competitors? Well, the looks are certainly unique, and so is the powertrain, a non-plug-in petrol-electric hybrid. It offers a rather different driving experience to that you get in a comparable diesel, but the tax advantages are substantial. And, of course, the current zeitgeist is with Lexus here, because diesel power plants are increasingly demonised by European governments. Much of what's on offer here is borrowed from Toyota technology, the stiff GAC platform we first saw in the CHR, uh, the two-litre hybrid engine originally launched in the Corolla, the optional E4 four-wheel drive system that's familiar from the fifth-generation RAV4, but it all claims to have been polished with an extra degree of Lexus finesse for a classier user experience, which you might logically expect to be the defining meaning of the UX name. Actually, those letters apparently stand for Urban Explorer, or creative urban explorer, to quote the marketing spiel. In other words, curbs can be mounted, but as ever, uh, with cars in this segment, you're going to have to leave the Serengeti to bare grills. Perhaps it's appropriate that Lexus has turned up fashionably late to this importantly aspirational sector. The company believes that over 80% of buyers will never have owned one of the company's products before. Few of them will previously have ever had a hybrid. And some might not ever have previously owned a luxury branded automotive product at all. So will they like this one? Well, let's find out. Sooner or later, every buyer in this segment is going to have to switch to a power plant that is in some way electrified. If you're going to take the plunge now, Lexus reasons, then why not do so with a brand that has over two decades of experience with this technology? Not that actually you have much option if you're looking for a properly premium badged small SUV. Uh, at the time of the test, uh, Lexus was the only car maker offering any sort of full hybrid engine in this segment. And for the foreseeable future, it'll be the only car maker able to offer you a full hybrid engine with any real degree of affordability affordability in this sector. Now to emphasize this, the company has decided, uh, for our market at least, not to offer any conventional powertrains in this car. And of course, Lexus has long disdained the thought of any sort of diesel engine. UX buyers get the fourth generation version of the company's hybrid Synergy Drive power plant, not the 2.5 litre 176 bhp version of that package used in the fifth generation Toyota RAV4 and the Lexus ES, but the 2 litre 181 bhp unit we recently tried in the Toyota Corolla, which we're promised has been finessed for use in this more aspirational model. It's aided in this task by the fact that it's mated to a freshly adopted GAC global architecture platform that's more torsion rigid than anything Lexus has previously used, a chassis that also enables the UX to have the lowest centre of gravity of any vehicle in its class. This car is also surprisingly light for a hybrid and for any kind of SUV actually, thanks to a whole range of weight saving measures used in its body construction. And that all sounds pretty promising. 
Which is just as well because this model's rather difficult primary task lies in converting people who would normally buy diesel versions of small posh SUVs like the Volvo XC40, the BMW X1, Audi Q3 and the Jaguar E-Pace. That's a somewhat challenging brief given that of course this Lexus drives quite differently to those kinds of cars. It would do. The hybrid engine has nearly 50% less pulling power than a rival diesel. That's enough of a difference to mean the need for a very different style of driving. You don't make a hybrid engine go quickly by ramming your right foot to the floor, but by backing off the throttle between the single speed auto gearboxes virtual ratios in a way that lets the revs drop and lets the engine bite into its torque curve. Even once you master this, you'll find that things like overtaking maneuvers uh, have to be planned much further in advance than you might be used to. With previous smaller Lexus hybrid models, the issue is further exacerbated by the so-called rubber band effect, uh, a disconnect between the engine and its incorporated ECVT belt-driven automatic transmission that meant throttle stabs delivered a flare of revs, but not much appreciable forward motion. Uh, you still get that with the UX, but not quite to the same extent. Now, if you're switching from an older generation Lexus hybrid engine, say the 1.8 litre unit in the CT hatch or the 2.5 litre power plant in the NX SUV, you'll find that here the engineer's efforts to create more linear response to throttle input by putting the initial burden on the system's powerful electric motor have borne some fruit. The single speed transaxle matches engine speed with acceleration more convincingly and you no longer have to spend so much time with the accelerator rammed against its bump stops when you're running late for whatever it is you've got to get to. Now hopefully that won't be at the end of an unlimited speed autobahn because maximum speed is restricted to just 110 miles an hour. Mind you, when was the last time you drove at over 110 miles an hour? The only slightly more relevant rest of 62 miles an hour stat is rated at 8.5 seconds, which is for the front driven model that we're trying here, which mates uh, the petrol engine to a single electric motor on the front axle. Lexus also offers a so-called E4 four wheel drive version of this package package which adds a further electric motor on the back axle. Uh, the resulting package doesn't add anything significant to the power output so overall performance is similar and it's nothing like as capable as a proper mechanical 4x4 setup for a start. It comes with a very pronounced frontward power bias but it'll be enough to deliver the extra winter traction that many owners need. Light field tracks are also within this car's remit in E4 form, uh, but given that there's just 160 mils of ground clearance, you'd be unwise to attempt anything more testing than that. That's not what this car is about, uh, nor will it suit as a tow car. Towing capacity, both braked and unbraked, is limited to just 750 kilos. As with all Lexus hybrids, every version of the UX can be driven in three ways, by the electric motors only, as is the case from start off uh, for about 1.2 miles using the provided EV mode, uh, with just the engine if you're giving it full throttle, or more usually with a combination of both. Uh, during deceleration and under braking, the engine switches off and both the electric motors act as high output generators, recovering kinetic energy that automatically recharges the batteries for the next time the hybrid system is able to switch back into electric only mode. In an F-Sport model like this one, steering wheel paddles are provided not to change gear but to allow you to play a part in the energy harvesting process by hiring or lowering the level of regenerative braking. To achieve anything like the quoted efficiency returns, you'll also need to keep the provided drive mode select driving setting system in its most frugal eco mode and try to keep the instrument cluster's hybrid system indicator gauge in its most mean spirited charge and eco sections. If, rather understandably, you uh, think life's too short to continually drive with such a frugal mindset, there's also a default normal setting and Sport and Sport S modes, which switch the central dial into a rev counter and deliver up slightly more urgent acceleration. If you've opted for an F Sport model and you've paid the extra for AVS, Adaptive Variable Suspension, uh, that allows the drive mode select settings to alter damping. Then you'll get a more focused Sport S Plus mode too. With that engaged, decently rapid secondary road point-to-point -point journeys are possible in a UX, but even then you're never really encouraged to start flinging the thing about. 
When we've pushed on a little through the turns with this car, we've found that it hangs on quite well, aided by the stiff structure we referenced earlier, and uh, also by that steering that, although it's quite light, is a little more direct and feelsome than is the case with uh, usual Lexus models. Um, the active cornering assist torque vectoring system is also useful here. Uh, it's integrated into the VSC stability control setup, and it's able to apply a degree of brake control on the inside wheels during spirited cornering and it suppresses any tendency to understeer and it helps to keep the car faithful to your chosen line through the bend. But of course, as with any hybrid, this car is far more in its element when you're merely cruising about, aided on the highway by a package of aerodynamic enhancements that Lexus reckon have improved high-speed stability. Uh, now, they may also have enhanced refinement, which is predictably superb by rumbly class standards. Going back to a diesel rival after living with one of these would be something of a culture shock. And after trying a UX, there is just a chance that you might not actually want to. Lexus design has always been angular and different and the UX does indeed offer a distinctive take on what a small premium SUV should look like. Uh, the Japanese brand didn't want to conform to the established solid chunky crossover look and as a result we're not for the roof rails and the faintly squarical shaped wheel arch cladding you might struggle to visually pigeonhole this as an SUV at all. Maybe that's just the point. Lexus is trying to blur the boundaries here to make movement into this car from, say, uh, a BMW 1 Series or a Mercedes A-Class that much easier. As with all the company's modern models, this spindle grille is central to the styling theme. Uh, its mesh in this case is made up of individual elements that seem to gradually change in shape as they radiate out from that central Lexus emblem. Uh, styling lines flow from this feature to envelop the cabin and the flanking LED headlamps are topped by LED daytime running lights and an arrowhead design. Plus, there are dramatic vertical bodywork slashes flowing down into the low-set fog lamps. Uh, you might like it, you might not, but this car certainly has a degree of overtaking presence. And in profile, well, you might struggle to call it beautiful, but it makes a certain kind of statement with crisp sculpted surfaces embellished in this case by this optional multi-layered blazing carnelian special metallic mica paint finish. Uh, this perfectly sets off the black door mirror housings and the more dynamically styled 18-inch alloy wheels that are unique to this F-Sport variant. Uh, aerodynamically orientated 17-inch wheels are fitted to the base version and either way, the rims sit in in black wheel arch mouldings that are prominently styled to manage airflow across flanking panels that are distinguished by this curiously shaped lower rubbing strip. As is becoming fashionable these days, the rear perspective is dominated by an LED tail light blade which extends the full width of the tailgate. Uh, the lamp section in this case made up of an array of 120 LEDs and tapering in the middle to just three mils deep at its narrowest point. Intricate finishing of that sort is a Lexus hallmark, hence the wafer thin shut lines and the way that the exterior surfaces have been refined to a hundredth of a millimeter tolerance that apparently pushes the boundary of what could be produced in the body panel stamping process. Uh, the lower diffuser is marked by angular outer reflectors and there's a wing type spoiler at the rear edge of the roof. As usual, of course, what's more important is the stuff you can't see. Now, this tailgate is made from composite materials, but most of the other body panels, uh, the bonnet, the side doors and the wings, are fashioned from aluminium. All of it bolted to a high-strength GAC platform that makes extensive use of high tensile steel. Enough. You're going to want to know about the interior. Now, this is, after all, the area that tends to set a premium brand SUV apart from a volume branded model. And as you'd expect, lots of effort has apparently been made here to conform to that standard. Any car company can add chrome and leather into a car's cabin. A properly premium model, though, has to be distinguished by an attention to detail that goes further than that. Uh, to take just one example here, uh, Lexus engineers worked with neural scientists to create the best possible door-closing sound. 
And every car that comes off the Kyushu production line is inspected by Takumi craftspeople in a dedicated quiet room to ensure that the prescribed oral experience is never altered. It's a detailed touch, but then detailed touches are what Lexus owners really appreciate. Hence the red stitch dash on this F Sport model or the unique washy grained fascia finish on the Takumi variant inspired by the surfacing of the traditional screens found in Japanese houses. You might also like the subtle in integrated LED lighting, including an interior light that activates with a swipe of your finger, and the electric window mechanism that gradually slows the progress of the glass panel as it reaches upwards, so it closes with a lovely softened thud. It's all supposed to contribute to what Lexus likes to call the spirit of Omotenashi, the oriental style of welcome embellished here by what the company calls Engawa, a traditional Japanese architecture concept that aims to blur the boundary between the outside and the inside of a home, hence the way that from the driver's seat, the upper section of the instrument panel appears to extend out beyond the windscreen into the wings. Uh, now, it is true that you don't get the hewn from granite feeling of quality and depth that you would find in say a rival Audi Q3, but interesting design and soft touch surfacing helps to compensate, as does thoughtful driver's seat positioning that sees all the main controls uh, being easily operable while you maintain a comfortable posture. We also like the uh, Lexus Climate Concierge system. Now this uses infrared technology to monitor the body temperatures of front seat occupants and adjusts the climate control settings to suit. And it even takes into account uh, factors like sun light shining into one side of the cabin. Perhaps inevitably though there are also design elements here that don't work quite so well. Uh, this binnacles stitched cowl top is lovely. The horn style controls sticking out of either side of it aren't. As in the ES and the LC these just look odd and they're a bit of a stretch to reach although the dial style settings that they offer for the driving modes on the left and for traction control on the right work well enough. Uh, more significantly though we simply don't understand why so many of the functions of the brand's Lexus navigation package have to be activated via this fiddly touchpad down by the gear stick. Uh, it's almost impossible to use properly on a bumpy road and it's generally much less intuitive than the simple circular dial that you get with a rival BMW iDrive infotainment system. To be fair, Lexus has tried to improve this setup here, adding some extra shortcut buttons ahead of the center storage box lid that make activation of the main audio and media functions a little easier. As for the other infotainment features, uh, things like navigation, car information, and access to various downloadable apps, well, accessing these via this maddening touchpad is for us still better than having to stab away at a touchscreen as you would have to do in a rival Volvo XC40 or Jaguar E-Pace. And it's also better than fiddling with the haptic touch sensitive dash buttons that you have to use in an Audi Q3. It's nice to see an old fashioned CD player included too. Uh, mainstream UX models get a 7 inch Lexus media display center dash screen like this one, but you can pay more or go for top Takumi trim and you get a larger 10.3 inch Lexus navigation monitor. Uh, both infotainment packages lack a near essential feature in this class though, Apple CarPlay or Android Auto smartphone mirroring, although uh, Lexus does plan to introduce that soon. And both displays are flanked a little incongruously by a little analog clock that's borrowed from the brand's flagship LS Luxury Saloon. The rather over-buttoned three-spoke wheel is from the LS2, and the instrumentation that you view through that is a real cabin talking point, or at least it is on this F-Sport model anyway. It's based on the layout used by the brand's old LFA supercar, with colours and graphics that change according to the driving mode that you select. Uh, the single central dial is usually a hybrid indicator with eco, power and charge sections, but if you select one of these sport driving modes, it transforms itself into a rev counter. That's very neat, as is the way that when you press this uh, steering wheel button here, uh, the dial slides neatly to the right to reveal an informational panel with trip computer, compass, audio and safety setting info. Plus, it can also show a scaled back version of that energy monitor and even a G-forces readout. 
One of the things that you might want in choosing an SUV is a slightly elevated driving position. Well, you don't get that here. Your seating position is very family hatch-like. Now, we mentioned earlier that this makes acclimatization from a more ordinary model somewhat easier, but it does also mean that all-round visibility suffers, especially in a design like this one with a kicked-up rear window line. Hence, Lexus's decision to standardize a rear-view camera across the range, although disappointingly, you do have to pay extra for rear parking sensors with entry-level trim. At least the seats are supportive though. They feature springs and foam padding designed to uh, disperse pressure under the sciatic area. And finding a comfortable position is easy, although we, uh, we could do with a little more reach adjustment on the steering wheel here. What else? Uh, well, the optional head-up display is one of the more informative of its type. Uh, the optional 13-speaker, 668-watt Mark Levinson premium surround sound system is glorious. And as ever with the Lexus hybrid model, you get a selectable energy monitor in both the instrument cluster and on the center dash screen that at any given time shows you how the drivetrain is working and what's powering what. Uh, we also like the fact that the climate system can be operated either from the center dash screen or by using this row of piano style buttons on the center stack. And build quality, that seems up to standard with scratchy plastic relegated to areas that you'll rarely touch. We're not too happy about some aspects of this UX model's cabin practicality though. Uh, the door bins are tiny, as is the glove box, uh, room within which is nearly completely taken up by the handbook. An overhead sunglasses compartment has also been forgotten. Uh, what you do get though is this storage compartment here between the seats, which incorporates a couple of USB ports and an aux in point. In front of the gear lever, uh, there are these two deeply recessed cup holders, and there's the option of adding in a wireless phone charger mat beyond that. Uh, you get ticket clip recesses in the sun visors too. Okay, time to take a seat in the rear. At nearly four and a half meters in length, the UX is a fraction longer than the segment norm, and that's a hopeful sign for back seat occupants. More significantly though, this Lexus is also slightly narrower and shorter of height than most of its rivals. Uh, to take just one example, a Jaguar E-Pace is 129 millimeters taller. The inevitable result of that uh, is that accessibility could be better. I mean, reaching in through these narrow door openings to to strap up a child, for example, isn't as easy as it would be in obvious rivals. To be fair, unless you're particularly infirm, getting in and out isn't too difficult because Lexus has optimized the hip point and the shape of the seat cushion. Plus, once you are in, although the gently swept up window line might for some combine with rear privacy glass to deliver a slight spirit of claustrophobia, the low set positioning of the bench helps a little to compensate for the lack of ceiling height. The footwells are a bit tight though, and that's despite the fact that the center transmission tunnel, fortunately, isn't too prominent. Ideally, you really won't want to take more than a couple of folk back here. Uh, not only is the cabin narrow, but the central part of the seat is uncomfortably raised. If there are a couple of occupants, you'll be able to use this central armrest here, which as you'd want, incorporates a couple of cup holders. Uh, there are twin vents, plus a couple of USB ports, but no door bins, although there are uh, seat back pockets. Forget any thoughts of being able to move the seat base. The hybrid system sat beneath it makes that impossible. Finally, let's take a look in the boot, space within which is always a worry with any hybrid model. As is the case here, you have to hump your luggage over quite a high loading lip to reach this cargo area. And once you have, you won't be able to get much of it in. Uh, there's 320 litres of capacity here. That's well down on the class standard. Uh, to give you some segment perspective, a Volvo XC40 has 432 litres, an Audi Q3, 530 litres, and a Jaguar E-Pace, 572 litres. That's nearly twice as much. Uh, three carry-on cases is all that will fit in here. Even an XC40 can manage seven. Now, Lexus says that anyone wanting more carriage space would be more likely to opt for their slightly larger NX SUV. But even that car's boot is only 475 litres in size. Battery placement for the hybrid system is inevitably to blame here, which usually means you don't get any underfloor storage space. Uh, 
In this case, though, the base of the cargo area raises to reveal quite a useful storage well, smartly trimmed at its base by a carpet mat. Unfortunately, Lexus hasn't thought to make that surfacing reversible from muddy boots. And while we're grumbling, uh, we will mention that the parcel shelf cover is one of the cheapest and flimsiest we've ever come across. On the plus side, unlike most of its rivals, Lexus hasn't forgotten to include a 12-volt socket back here. It's there on the left. Uh, there are bag hooks on both cargo walls, and there are the usual four tie-down points on the floor. The transport of longer items won't be easy. You can't have a ski hatch or a 40-20-40 rear seat back split. Uh, when the rear bench does flatten... 1,231 litres of capacity is freed up, which isn't enormous, but which will probably be sufficient for the needs of most likely owners. For our market, the UX range offers only one engine option, a self-charging 2-litre petrol-electric hybrid, uh, which comes with a UX 250H badge. Other countries get a UX 200 variant too, which features a conventional 2-litre petrol turbo engine that Lexus says it could offer here if there was demand for it. But British buyers didn't want that unit in the larger NX model, hence its absence here. As for the choices that you do get in the UX lineup, well, there are two-wheel drive or E4 four-wheel drive drivetrain options, and there are three trim levels, standard UX, F Sport, which is what we got here, and the top Takumi variant. Most will want the front-driven version of this car, and for that, prices start uh, just uh, a fraction under £30,000 for the base variant. That is uh, really where the value is because there's quite a premium to pay over entry-level spec if you want a nicer trim level. £4,000 more for this S-Sport or over £9,000 more for the top Takumi spec flagship version. As for the extra cost involved in going for the E4 four-wheel drive system, well, Lexus quotes that as being £1,250, but the premium to go from front-wheel drive to four-wheel drive will seem a lot bigger than that if you're ordering your UX in base or F-Sport trim. That's because E4 UX models with those two trim grades have also to come non-negotiably with extra equipment features that would be optional on a purely front-driven version, specifically a sunroof and what the brand calls its Premium Plus Pack, which gives you niceties like leather trim, a powered tailgate and keyless entry. As a result, a base UX E4 actually costs £6,200 more than the base two-wheel drive model, while an F-Sport E4 costs £4,300 more than the two-wheel drive variant. So unless you wanted all that extra kit anyway, you might want to think carefully about whether four driven wheels are really necessary for you on this Lexus. Uh, since the top Takumi variant doesn't need any additional kit embellishment, the extra cost to go from a front-driven to an E4 version there actually is £1,250. Enough with range and trimming semantics, where does the UX fit into the Lexus model lineup? Well, from launch, it was pitched in rough terms about £5,000 above the company's ageing CT200H hatchback, which uses an older generation 1.8 litre hybrid engine, and about £6,000 below the company's slightly larger NX SUV, which uses a bigger 2.5 litre hybrid. If you really want a UX, it's probably unlikely that you'll have been previously considering either of those two models. So you can see why the Japanese brand thinks that nearly all UXs will be bought by people owning a Lexus for the very first time. As for rivals, well, the motoring press will tell you that there are plenty, but the truth is that there's nothing quite the same. Uh, the only SUVs you can buy at around this price point that use self-charging hybrid power are the Toyota RAV4 and the Honda CR-V. Both cost around about the same as this UX and offer more interior and boot space, but neither contender really qualifies as a premium brand model, and the Honda will cost you significantly more to run. It's more likely that you'll be considering models more closely sized against this Lexus and with badge work that's better suited to Waitrose and Tesco. So we're thinking here of the obvious posh, compact SUV contenders that you might already have on your mental shopping list. The BMW X1, uh, the Audi Q3, the Mercedes GLA, the Jaguar E-Pace and the Volvo XC40. 
Now, at the time of this Lexus model's launch, all of these models limited themselves to conventional petrol and diesel engines. And since a conventional petrol power plant in one of these cars would be so much more expensive to run than a UX hybrid, it's most likely that you'll be considering the diesel versions of those competitors against this Lexus. And hopefully you'll remember to uh, factor in the automatic gearbox that will cost you more on the contenders that I just mentioned. But which is, of course, integral to the hybrid powertrain here. Or you might be trying to make those kinds of comparisons anyway. Uh, when you drill down into it, direct comparisons against this Lexus are a lot more difficult to make than the motoring press would have you believe. Uh, for a start, at the time of this test in summer 2019, Mercedes was no longer selling a diesel version of its first generation GLA. And that's a car that's not especially economical in petrol form. So that's one potential rival crossed out already. Uh, the Jaguar E-Pace quickly falls by the wayside too. Uh, the most comparable D150 diesel front driven version of that car can't be had in automatic form so that's difficult to directly compare against volume versions of this Lexus. Uh, the Range Rover Evoque has the same issue because it uses the same powertrain. Uh, both the E-Pace and the Evoque do come in D150 auto guises if you want all-wheel drive and in that form they'll save you either £3,000 or £1,000 respectively but both have a weight problem which makes them much pricier to run than this Lexus. A Range Rover Evoque incidentally offers a mild hybrid engine option but that's not at all the same thing as a full hybrid power plant as that car's fuel and emission stats will soon tell you. So we're whittling the options down. Audi's Q3 can't quite match the Lexus proposition here either. Now initially you might think that a Q3 in its most popular 35 TDI 150 PS S-Tronic Sport form would be a decent alternative to a base UX until you find out that the Audi costs around £4,000 more and is about 30% dirtier when it comes to emissions. And if you want your Q3 35 TDI with Quattro four-wheel drive, you can't have auto transmission. For an auto with four-wheel drive and a Q3, you have to graduate up to the Q3 40 TDI, which costs about the same as a UX E4, but is much pricier to run. Now that leaves us with the Volvo XC40, which we'd reckon to be probably the best all-round rival to this Lexus. But a comparable XC40 D3 auto with base spec costs £2,000 more than an entry-level front-driven UX, and is 30% dirtier and significantly slower. A base spec XC14 D3 auto all-wheel drive form would save you around £3,000 over the cheapest Lexus UX E4 model, but much of that saving would be eroded if you equipped the Volvo to Lexus levels. And again, the Swedish product would cost you much more to run. Enough. We've done all the price and spec comparisons so you don't have to. And we've concluded, as you might, that there's actually nothing quite like a UX. Now, if you find yourself concurring and you want to know more, then your interest might be sealed by a generous standard specification. Is that what Lexus is offering here? Well, let's see. Outside, an entry-level UX variant comes fitted with 17-inch alloy wheels and like all versions of this car, it gets LED headlamps with an automatic high beam along with LED technology that also features with the daytime running lights and the rear lamp clusters. Plus, there are auto headlamps and wipers, uh, roof rails, heated mirrors, headlamp washers and an alarm. Plus, you get adaptive cruise control which can automatically control your highway speeds relative to the other vehicles around you. And that's part of the uh, comprehensive Lexus Safety System Plus package of standard camera-driven safety kit that we'll cover off you in more detail in a few minutes' time. Inside, all UX models come with dual-zone climate control with a humidity sensor and a four-mode version of the Drive Mode Select system, which allows you to tweak throttle response, steering feel and gear shift timings to suit the way that you want to drive. Uh, there's LED interior lighting, a leather-stitched multifunction steering wheel, a reversing camera and acoustic windscreen. In Entertainment, that's taken care of by a 7-inch Lexus media display screen, which uses a remote touch tracer control electrostatic touch touchpad and which gives you navigation, Bluetooth phone compatibility, plus an eight-speaker DAB audio system. 
Most potential UX buyers, though, will be considering the more dynamic-looking F-Sport level of trim that we have here. Uh, F-Sport variants get that more dynamic look thanks to special 18-inch alloy wheels, uh, black front spindle grille and black door mirror housings. Inside, you get bespoke F-Sport seats that are heated, power-adjustable, uh, feature lumbar adjustment and come trimmed in a combination of fabric and Tahara man-made leather. Plus, there's F-Sport spec for the pedals and for the steering wheel. At this level of the range, uh, the kit also runs to rear privacy glass, uh, LED front fog lights, a heated steering wheel, run-flat tyres and a memory setting for the door mirrors. In addition, F-Sport buyers get steering wheel paddle shifters which allow you to alter the level of regenerative braking and an active sound control system which channels an emotive engine noise soundtrack through the speakers. You also get a bespoke instrument cluster too and that has a neat movable dial. That's a layout that's borrowed from the brand's old LFA supercar. If ultimate luxury is your priority, then the top Takumi level of trim is what you'll need. And that's named after the brand skilled Takumi craftsman. As you might expect, uh, this variant really does include almost everything you could possibly want. Uh, outside, there are bespoke 18-inch alloy wheels. Plus, at this level, you get triple projector LED headlights, uh, power folding mirrors, a sunroof, a powered tailgate, smart entry keyless entry, and some extra camera-driven safety features. Again, we'll cover those off in a few minutes. Uh, inside, you get a head-up display. There are beautiful washy paper grain inlays, and you uh, enjoy eight-way power adjustment heated and ventilated smooth leather front seats. Uh, there's power adjustment for the steering wheel too. The audio setup moves up a grade at Takumi level as well, and that's courtesy of a thumping 13 speaker, a Mark Levinson premium surround sound system. This is activated through a much larger 10.3 inch Lexus navigation and multimedia display center dash screen. And that's where you'll view the Takumi variant's 360 degree surround view camera system. On to extra cost features and your starting point here will be the various option packs that Lexus offers. And which of these you consider will depend on the spec level that you're looking at. So let's start with the packs that you can add in if you're wanting base UX trim. Uh, there's a parking pack which gives you the all-round parking sensors that are missing from the spec at that level in the range. But your dealer will of course want you to go further. Uh, your salesperson is likely to prevail on you to at least stretch to the premium pack which costs £2,200 more and which upgrades you with larger 18 inch wheels, front and rear parking sensors, rear privacy glass, an auto dimming rear view mirror and heat for the front seats and the steering wheel. Or even better perhaps you could go for the premium plus pack that uh, we've already mentioned and that includes all those premium pack niceties along with leather upholstery, a powered tailgate, smart entry keyless entry, LED cornering lights, illuminated exterior door handles and the washy paper grain interior trim inlays that we mentioned earlier. Uh, now another advantage of going for either of those premium packs on the base UX is that you'll then be able to go further and add in either the optional tech and safety pack, uh, which we'll cover off for you when we talk about safety, or the tech and sound pack. Now that will give you a package of the real niceties, that Mark Levinson sound system, power adjustment for the front seats and for the steering column too, um, electric lumbar support, a head-up display, a wireless charging tray and intelligent parking sensors. Most UX buyers uh, will have as their starting point though the F Sport trim model we're testing here. So what can you add in at this level? Well, there's a special F Sport version of that Premium Plus pack that we just mentioned, and that includes most of the features we referenced. Plus, it also incorporates the larger 10.3 inch Lexus navigation screen, powered uh, steering column adjustment, and an audio upgrade with a DVD player. Uh, you might also want to consider the special S Sport version of the Tech and Safety pack. Uh, that's what you'll need to get the brand's AVS, that's Adaptive Variable Suspension System. Now, this allows you to auto ride quality working through the settings of the car's drive mode select system which with ABS uh, gains an extra mode sport s plus 
Now, if you're not short on budget and you've decided on an F Sport Spec UX, you might simply tick the box for the optional Takumi pack. Now, this includes everything that you'll get on the F Sport Premium Plus pack and also the F Sport Tech and Safety pack. And then it also adds in the stuff that you'll really want to spoil yourself with the Mark Levinson surround sound system, the 360 degree panoramic view monitor, uh, the sunroof, and the ventilated front seats with memory settings. What else? Uh, well, let's tell you that on base and F Sport spec models, you can add in a sunroof as a standalone option if you don't want to get that feature as part of one of the option packs that we just mentioned. Uh, as for optional practicalities, well, even though this UX can't tow much of a weight, you can still add in a tow hitch. And uh, more relevantly, you can add in the roof crossbars that will allow you to fit options like bike carriers, a roof box or a holder for skis or snowboards. Uh, you can add in an adventure protection pack to protect the bodywork and an ashtray is available if you haven't yet kicked the habit. Uh, and when you have kicked it, you can use that receptacle as a storage bin. On to aesthetics. Now you'll almost certainly want to uh, pay your dealer more for your choice of paint colour. Various extra cost metallic shades are offered and there are some pricier but more exclusive special metallic paint colours offered too. Uh, we've got one of those here actually, Blazing Carnelian, which has a particular vividness and depth created by using a multi-layer paint process which combines a red base with a yellow mica interface layer. You might want to add in the optional gloss black machined 18 inch alloy wheels too, possibly the optional style pack and maybe also rear skirts or side skirts. Enough, let's move on to safety. Now earlier we referenced the standard Lexus Safety System Plus package that all UX models get as standard, which includes six camera driven elements of safety technology. We'll start with a feature that all cars of this kind now need to have, autonomous braking. Uh, Lexus calls its setup a pre-collision system and it works as all these kinds of setups do, scanning the road ahead in search of potential collision hazards as you drive at speeds of between 7 and 110 miles an hour. If one's detected, you'll be warned. If you don't respond or perhaps you aren't able to, the brakes will automatically be applied to decrease the severity of any resulting accident. Now this setup is also able to specifically identify people and it'll apply braking if a pedestrian is detected in front of your UX, even at night. In the daytime, it can specifically detect cyclists too. The other five Lexus Safety System Plus features can be quickly covered. The Lane Center Lane Keep Assist setup warns dozy drivers who've drifted out of their lanes on the highway, uh, applying steering lock to ease the car back to where it ought to be, and works seamlessly with the adaptive cruise control system we mentioned earlier. The Steering Assist Lane Trace Assist feature helps you to keep the car centered in its lane. Uh, automatic high beam automatically dips your headlights for you at night, and RSA road sign assist pictures road signs on the move and then displays them on the dash. As for more conventional safety kit fitted to all UX models, well, pretty much everything you'd expect is present and correct. So tick off a pedestrian-friendly bonnet, uh, ice fix child seat fastenings, and no fewer than eight airbags, twin front side and curtain bags, plus knee bags for both front seat passengers. Uh, across the range, you'll also find a tyre pressure warning system and hill start assist control, which stops you from uh, drifting backwards on uphill junctions. Uh, there's also emergency brake signal signaling for panic stops. Uh, we also like the PKSA parking support brake system which can automatically brake the car as part of parking maneuvering if you're just about to hit something solid or moving when you're trying to park um, a low wall that you haven't noticed for example. In addition, there are all the usual electronic aids for braking, traction and stability. Systems that in most other cars will only activate at the last minute if the situation demands it. In the UX though, it's all done a bit more cleverly. The so-called Lexus Vehicle Dynamics Integration Management Setup uh, coordinates everything together and takes action to correct the car just that little bit earlier. Um, now there's also an incorporated e-call system which will automatically alert the emergency services with your precise GPS location if the airbags go off in an accident. 
At the top of the UX range on the Takumi model, Lexus also offers two further camera-driven safety features. Uh, a blind spot monitor works on the move to stop you from dangerously pulling out to overtake in front of another car. And an alert rear cross-traffic alert system warns you of an approaching vehicle when you're reversing out of parking space. Now, both those features are optional on the two lesser variants. Lexus claims to have conducted research that suggests that since most owners of plug-in hybrid models don't bother to regularly plug them in, these cars spend more of their time running on thirsty petrol power. Obviously, the advantage of a so-called self-charging hybrid like this one is that you don't have to connect it up to a power point, but there is still a need for the driver to very much play a part in making the technology effective. Throttle application becomes crucial to the extent to which the battery-driven electric motors are allowed to help out the engine. And to facilitate that, when driving in the car's most frugal eco mode, you'll have to become expert in keeping the instrument cluster's hybrid system indicator gauge in its most mean-spirited charge and eco sections. If you can do that, the possible returns achievable here can be excellent. As a real-time expression of just what might be possible, Lexus took the opportunity just before this UX model's launch to conduct what it reckoned was a real-world driving test period intended to simulate likely owner, mixed urban and highway use over 4,076 miles on UK roads. When the car was analysed afterwards, it was discovered that it had spent over half its time, 54%, in full electric EV mode and had actually covered 38% of the total distance under pure electric drive, hence a very creditable 51.7 miles per gallon fuel showing. That's pretty close to the official WLTP rated combined cycle figure uh, for the front driven UX model in question, 53.3 mpg which in turn is very similar to the kind of reading you get from a direct diesel rival like BMW's X1 S-Drive 18D Auto and Volvo's XC40 D3 Auto, although it is about 10% less than you get from a comparable Audi Q3, the 35 TDI S-Tronic. For reference, we'll tell you that a UX E4 four-wheel drive model manages up to 47 mpg, which again is a showing that's pretty comparable to direct 4x4 diesel auto rivals and 20% better than you get from a diesel auto four-wheel drive version of a car like a Jaguar E-Pace or the Range Rover Evoque. So Lexus is in the right ballpark with fuel returns and of course UX owners will be filling their cars up with significantly cheaper fuel. But as company users will know, the real savings possible with a hybrid lie with reduced tax liability. A front driven UX can put out as little as 94 grams per kilometre of CO2, which equates to a benefiting kind tax liability of just 22%, which to save you doing the sums means a total BIK liability over a typical three year 30,000 mile period of £8,087. Now let's look at how the direct opposition fare. Uh, this car's most efficient diesel rival, BMW X1, in its most comparable 18D S-Drive auto form, puts out 113 grams per kilometre of CO2 and therefore attracts a BIK rating of 32%. And that means an overall BIK cost uh, that would be £4,167 more than this Lexus to run over that period. And as for the car that so many of these so-called experts will recommend that you choose in this segment, uh, the Volvo XC40, well, in comparable D3 momentum auto form, that smokes out 131 grams per kilometre and that attracts a 34% BIK rating and therefore will cost £4,893 more to run over the same three-year, 30,000-mile period as this Lexus. Of course, it doesn't stop there. BIK tax liability and fuel economy are just the two most obvious parameters that affect running costs. Uh, the UX also shows up well when it comes to factors like depreciation, employers' NI liability, and VED road tax payments. Lexus has done calculations, which we've no reason to doubt, uh, taking all these factors, along with fuel and BIK payments, into account. And as a result, they reckon that a typical front-driven UX 250H would actually cost you a total of £18,699 to run, all things taken into account, over that three-year 30,000-mile period.
Now that sounds a lot until you realize that using the same cost parameters, uh, that equivalent Volvo XC40 we just mentioned would cost you £5,790 more than this Lexus to operate. And that apparently frugal BMW X1 that we mentioned would actually cost you £8,740 more than this Lexus to run. That makes you think, doesn't it? Back to how you can use this UX with efficiency in mind. As usual on a Lexus hybrid, there's an available EV button that is supposed to fix the car in electrified motion, which can apparently take place at up to 70 miles an hour. In reality though, you'll find that the lithium ion batteries are hardly ever charged up enough for you to be able to use that feature. And even when you can, it'll only last for just over a mile. It's much better to allow the car to decide its own electrified policy, which as a reference earlier it actually does rather often this can make you feel rather smug when you're inching along in smoky diesel traffic with the uh, engine seamlessly disabled and battery power silently in motion at which point you might like to monitor the hybrid system's cleverness on the energy display that you'll find on the center console monitor uh, the same display also provides graphical trip information and history screens so you can gauge your ongoing success in fuel economy and energy regeneration all of this technology might make you worry about this UX model's uh, reliability, but the Prius-derived engineering that's in use here scores very highly in almost every customer satisfaction survey going, so it's actually quite surprising that Lexus hasn't followed its partner Toyota's lead and offered a five-year warranty on its cars. Instead, the UX has to be covered by an unremarkable three-year 60,000-mile deal that doesn't seem overly generous in this day and age. You can, of course, pay extra to extend this cover, apparently uh, up to as much as 10 years and 140,000 miles, but in our view you shouldn't have to. The hybrid components and the hybrid battery are covered by a separate 5 year 60,000 mile warranty. Not that any of this is likely to ever matter. This is, after all, a Lexus, a car in which market experience suggests virtually nothing is ever likely to go wrong. The facts are that hybrid technology generates fewer warranty claims than conventional petrol or diesel engines do. And if something ever should happen, so charming and uh, so helpful are the award-winning dealers in the network that you may end up being almost glad that it did. That is just as well because you're going to be visiting them relatively often for routine maintenance. Uh, servicing intervals are every year or 10,000 miles. That's a bit more frequent than we'd like, although a prepaid servicing plan can help to keep costs in check. At least the cost of those garage visits should be surprisingly low. That's thanks to the low maintenance requirements that's uh, built into this car's hybrid Synergy drive system. As part of this, there's no starter motor or alternator to go wrong, no drive belts to break, uh, there's a maintenance-free timing chain, no particulate filter to get clogged up with fumes, and of course, thanks to the CVT automatic gearbox, there's no clutch either. The hybrid setup has a good record for minimizing tire wear, and the battery will last the life of the car. Plus, the regenerative braking setup helps to extend the life of the brake pads. What else? Well, we mentioned VED vehicle excise duty payments earlier on. Uh, a standard front-driven UX 250H will cost between 115 and 155 pounds to tax in the first year, depending on the variant you choose, with a 130 pound per annum figure applied from year two. Talking of tax, be careful when adding optional extras to the pricey Takumi model because these will take the list price to over £40,000, which will net you a £310 vehicle excise duty surcharge from the revenue. We'll finish with insurance. The front-driven UX 250H model is rated at Group 22E in base and F-Sport guises, or Group 26E if you opt for the top Takumi version. If you're interested in the, uh, the UX 250H E4 models, it's Group 23E for the base and F-Sport variants, or Group 26E for the Takumi model. You might wonder whether the market really needs another posh little SUV like this, but we'd contend that this segment wasn't really complete until Lexus properly entered it. True to form, the Japanese brand's the only one of the established players in this class to offer the option of hybrid power, and that in itself will be enough to garner this UX significant interest from a market where plenty of buyers want an alternative to diesel. 
These people have found petrol engines too thirsty, plug-in hybrids too expensive, and full electric models too limiting. Self-charging hybrid technology might now be two decades old, but along with the Toyota, Lexus has spent that time perfecting it. No one knows more about how to get the best from this kind of engine. Other parts of the UX are also easy to like. The styling's distinctive, and the cabin is a refreshing change from Teutonic clinicality. Now, you could argue that a rival Audi Q3 has a deeper feeling of quality, or that a competing Volvo XC40 is a more complete all-round package, and there is some truth in that, but both those cars need specking up quite significantly to match the unique feel of this Lexus. That said, a UX is certainly not inexpensive and it can't quite offer the handling drive dynamics of its key premium rivals. Plus, it's smaller in the back and in the boot too. But for many likely buyers, those things won't matter very much. They'll appreciate this car's position as the cleanest contender in the class and also the fact that it's one of the most economic contenders you could choose in this segment. What we think that they'll like most, though, is the way that it's interesting, unusual and luxuriously sensible, as Lexus models tend to be.